A UNESCO World Heritage Site is a place or landmark with outstanding universal value to humanity. World Heritage Sites are chosen by the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, better known by its acronym UNESCO. To be on the list, a candidate must meet at least one of the 10 criteria, such as to represent a masterpiece of human creative genius, to bear a unique or exceptional testimony to a cultural tradition, or to contain a superlative natural phenomena or areas of exceptional natural beauty. In that sense, sites can be selected because of natural beauty such as the Great Barrier Reef or the Serengeti for example, or can be chosen because of cultural and often historical importance, the Pyramids of Giza or Stonehenge for example. It shouldn't come as a surprise then that World Heritage Sites are incredibly diverse. The list contains most places you would expect, the Taj Mahal, Machu Picchu, the Statue of Liberty, but it also has many places that most people have never heard of. Whether it be a national park in Tajikistan or a board mill in Finland, sites come in all shapes and sizes. They range from a single small monument to grand cathedrals, to massive natural landscapes, to entire islands or cities, and even one country. And there are a lot of them. As of 2019, there are 1,121 World Heritage Sites of which 869 are cultural, 213 natural and 39 are mixed. In this fourth instalment of Winners and Losers, I'm going to look at the diversity of the World Heritage Sites, comparing and contrasting them, and their place in the world. I'm going to start off by looking at number of sites by country. Which countries have the most? Starting with fifth place, we have France with 45. Fourth is Germany with 46. 3rd Spain with 48, and there's actually a tie for first place between China and Italy, both with 55. I've put China on top though by using shared sites, or sites that span two or more countries as a tiebreaker. Italy has six shared sites, whereas China only has one. China's 55 are split up into 37 cultural, 14 natural, and 4 mixed. Cultural sites tend to be the most well known of these, with notable examples being the Forbidden Palace, the Terracotta Army and of course the Great Wall. But China has a large number of natural sites as well, forests, mountains, rivers, etc. In fact, according to this list, China is the most naturally beautiful country, or at least has the most natural world heritage sites, with 14. Joint second place are Australia and the United States. Again though, Australia gets the edge with less shared sites. Now, switching to cultural sites, which countries come out on top? The top three are Italy, Germany and Spain. Perhaps an unsurprising winner, Italy has several of its cities in their entirety as World Heritage Sites and several more historic centres. These include Venice and its Lagoon, Verona and Vicenza, plus the historic centres of Rome, Florence, Naples and several more. Of course, at the opposite end of the spectrum, there are 30 countries with zero World Heritage Sites. Of these, 26 have no sites, while 4 countries haven't even adhered to the World Heritage Convention. Now, it's one thing to look at countries by just raw number of sites, but it's not really fair when you compare the 1.3 billion people of India to the 1.3 million of Estonia, nor is it fair to compare the 17 million square kilometres of Russia to the 17,000 of Kuwait. So in this category, I'm going to look at World Heritage Site Density by country. I'm going to split this up into cultural and natural sites, since cultural sites are human achievements and natural sites are, well, naturally occurring, I'll rank cultural sites by population and natural sites by land area. For cultural sites, there is a very, very clear winner. Literally the entire country is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Can you guess which one it is? I'll give you a hint, it's very small. It is of course the Holy See Vatican City. In fact, it's actually part of another heritage site. The historic centre of Rome also includes all of the Vatican, so the country is 200% UNESCO World Heritage Site. Okay, but other than the clearly unfair Vatican City, what are the other winners? For this list, I've left out countries with only one site, as this would skew the numbers in favour of the very small countries. With this exclusion, the winner is Malta, with three cultural sites and a population of less than half a million, meaning that Malta has 0.63 cultural heritage sites per 100,000 people. Coming in at second and third place, also with three sites each are Cyprus and Montenegro. 
Montenegro has two shared sites, which is why Cyprus takes second despite a higher population. Now you might be wondering, of the countries that don't have any cultural sites, which is the most populous? That would be the Democratic Republic of the Congo, with a whopping 86 million people. So what about natural sites? Again, I've excluded countries with just one site. The clear winner here is Seychelles, a small archipelago in the Indian Ocean, with two natural heritage sites despite being less than 500 square kilometres in size. The country has a nature reserve as well as the Aldabra Atoll. Of course, if we were only to include, you know, proper sized countries, the winners would be Switzerland, Denmark and Costa Rica, again with three sites each, coincidentally. Each of the top three has one shared site. For Switzerland, Monte San Giorgio, shared with Italy. For Denmark, the Warren Sea, shared with Germany and the Netherlands. And for Costa Rica, La Amistad International Park, shared with Panama. So who's the loser of this category? I.e. what's the largest country without a natural world heritage site? Well, that would be the 10th largest country in the world, Algeria, at nearly 2.4 million square kilometres. To be fair, more than four-fifths of the country is desert, so there's that. Moving on, and away from countries, taking a look at the world as a whole. UNESCO splits the world into five different regions. Regions which are a bit odd to say the least. The regions are Europe and North America, Latin America and the Caribbean, Africa, Arab states, and Asia and the Pacific. The clear winner here is Europe and North America, having by far the most sites overall, with 529. The region also has by far the most cultural sites, with actually more than all four other regions combined. Although natural sites, it comes in at second place behind Asia and the Pacific, which tops the list with 67. This is a map from the official UNESCO website, showing all the World Heritage sites on a global scale, showing the extent of the various sites. The next category I'm going to do is oldest and newest World Heritage sites. The list of UNESCO World Heritage sites began in 1978 with 12 entries on the list. Listed as number one are the Galapagos Islands of Ecuador. New World Heritage Sites are added every year, with 29 being added in 2019. Perhaps the most notable of these is the ancient city of Babylon, part of modern-day Iraq and location of one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the Hanging Gardens. But of course, when a site was inscribed into the World Heritage Site list doesn't have anything to do with how old or new it actually is. So what are some of the most ancient sites on the list? Well, many of the sites date back to before recorded history. Due to the uncertainty of the dates and the difficulty of this category, I'll just suggest a few potential candidates for the oldest site. Starting in France, we have the decorated cave of Pont d'Arc, containing the earliest known and best preserved figurative drawings in the world, possibly up to 32,000 years old. It's believed that around 20,000 years ago, a large boulder fell and blocked the entrance to the cave, therefore keeping it so well preserved until it was discovered in 1994. But of course, if you're looking for an actual structure that was built and is somewhat intact today, a good candidate might be Gobekli Tepe, an archaeological site in modern-day Turkey. What it actually is is still a mystery, but the leading thought is that it was some kind of temple. Dating the site is, of course, extremely difficult, but it was believed to have been constructed in the pre-pottery Neolithic, somewhere around 9500 BC. For context, that means that we in the present day are closer in time to the construction of the Pyramids of Giza than the construction of this structure is to them, predating them by six to 7,000 years. Now, the newest World Heritage Site was actually more challenging than I expected. The newest one I was able to find, and not even that new really, is the iconic Australian landmark, the Sydney Opera House, inaugurated in 1973. The Opera House was designed by Danish architect Jorn Utzon and according to UNESCO constitutes a masterpiece of 20th century architecture. Now moving on to something that usually comes first in winners and losers, size. It seemed less relevant in this episode. The largest on the list is actually a new entry in 2019, the French Austral Lands and Seas, at 67.3 million hectares. 
A little bit unfair though since it contains a whole slice of Antarctica, roughly equal to the size of the country of Iraq. A slice of Antarctica that isn't even any different from the rest of the continent. Next is the Phoenix Islands protected area of Kiribati. Again, not entirely fair since it's mostly water, but then again so are the next two on the list as well. In fifth place are the Galapagos Islands, 1000 kilometers west of the Ecuadorian mainland. These islands helped Charles Darwin develop his theory of natural selection and write his revolutionary book on the origin of species, published in 1859. On the other hand, the smallest heritage site seems to be a small family house, the Wrightville Schroeder House in the Dutch city of Utrecht, at 75 square metres, or 800 square feet. Built in 1924, the house is considered an icon of the modern movement in architecture, becoming a world heritage site in the year 2000. Other tiny sites include the Thracian tomb of Kazanlak in Bulgaria, at about double the size of the Schroeder House, and then there's also the Holy Trinity Column in the Czech Republic, which the UNESCO site lists as 0.05 hectares, or 500 square metres. Let's move on to the most visited sites. Now whether having the most visitors is the winner or loser of this category is debatable. On the one hand, having lots of visitors implies popularity, but tourist locations crowded with thousands and thousands of people is never fun. Not to mention, the entire point of the heritage list is conservation, and people can cause damage over time. Getting exact numbers for this wasn't easy, but a solid contender for the top spot is the Forbidden City Palace Complex in Beijing, with around 14 or 15 million visitors annually. Another possible candidate would be Paris, the Banks of the Seine, as the heritage site is called. The most visited place in Paris in 2018 was the Notre Dame Cathedral with 12 million visitors. Although given the tragic events that took place earlier this year, that may change in the future, unfortunately. Some other highly visited sites are, also in China, Kulan Su, a small pedestrian-only island off the southeast coast of the mainland, with more than 11 million annual visitors. Also with a similar number of visitors is the Great Smoky Mountains National Park in the United States. The park is part of the Appalachian Mountain chain, on the border between Tennessee and North Carolina. Earlier in the video, I briefly mentioned Shared Sites, a world heritage site that spans two or more countries. So which site spans the most countries? That would be the ancient and primeval beech forests of the Carpathians and other regions of Europe, to give it its official title, which spans 12 different countries. The site consists of many different forests across Europe from Spain to Ukraine and shows the adaptability of the beech tree and its ability to spread across an entire continent. Other extensive sites include the Struve Geodetic Arc, also in Europe, which is a chain of survey triangulations stretching from the tip of Norway all the way to the Black Sea, spanning 10 different countries. This system of markers was used in the 1800s to help determine the exact size and shape of the Earth. There's also the architectural work of Le Corbusier, an outstanding contribution to the modern movement. 17 sites, mostly in Europe, but also one each in Argentina, India and Japan, for a total of 7 countries. The sites maintaining their cultural significance or natural beauty is of the utmost importance to UNESCO. For this reason, some sites are designated in danger of losing their status for any number of reasons, such as pollution, deforestation, climate change, urban expansion, corruption and, quite often, war, unfortunately. There are currently 53 sites on this list. These include the historic centre of Vienna, the old city of Jerusalem, as well as the Everglades National Park. The big winners of this category are actually just the countries with the most sites. Of the top 5 countries, not one of them has a single site in danger, so that's good. On the flip side, the big losers here are Syria, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Libya and Afghanistan, four countries that have all their heritage sites in danger. There are two ways to get off the in danger list. One is to somehow improve the situation, or the other way, lose world heritage site status. Only two sites have ever lost their status. The Arabian Oryx Sanctuary in Oman was directly removed, skipping the in danger list altogether, being delisted in 2007 after the government's decision to reduce the size of the protected area by 90%. 
In addition, the Dresden Elbe Valley in Germany was delisted in 2009 due to a bridge being built across the valley which UNESCO viewed as damaging its cultural value. That's all for episode 4 of Winners and Losers, I hope you enjoyed it and as always feel free to leave your suggestions for episode 5. Now if you're interested in learning more about the first ever UNESCO World Heritage Site, the Galapagos Islands, I would highly recommend an absolutely fascinating documentary I watched called Wild Galapagos. This two-part documentary looks at several different unique and often unusual species, many of which arrived at the islands against their will, caught in the strong ocean currents. The documentary shows how these creatures adapted to an environment where they don't belong and how they interact with each other. If you would like to watch it, you can do so on CuriosityStream, an online streaming service with over 2400 documentaries and non-fiction titles, with content spanning science, nature, history, technology and so much more. Membership starts at a very affordable $2.99 a month and you can get started completely free with a 31 day trial by signing up at curiositystream.com forward slash wonder why and enter the promo code wonder why during the sign up process. A massive thank you once again to Curiosity Stream for helping support this channel by sponsoring this video. And of course, thanks to each and every one of you for watching. I'll see you in the next video.